to the November 28, 2018 edition of Space News. This is Peter Arad, and once again I have Michael Dura and Angelo de Grazzi with me from the Space Association. And we're going to look straight away at Space News from Australia once again. I love this. Black Sky Aerospace conducted Australia's first commercial space launch last week. Black Sky Aerospace, or BSA, a relatively unknown Brisbane-based aerospace company, conducted Australia's first ever launch carrying commercial payloads. The launch took place from the nation's only suborbital launch site near Gundawindi, Queensland, five hours west of Brisbane. The suborbital launch of the BSA's five-metre-long CITER-190 sounding rocket soared to approximately 20,000 feet, so I guess it didn't get to space, or 5,100 metres, and reached a maximum speed of Mark 1.2 in just a few seconds. The CITER-190 rocket has a mass of 80 kilograms and is propelled using solid fuel consisting of aluminium, ammonium chloride and proprietary ingredients. The launch carried experimental payloads including one for Hypersonics, another Australian launch startup developing the world's first hypersonic scramjet launch vehicle. Hypersonics tested sensor packages as well as a ceramic matrix composite panel, which the company plans on using for its own launch vehicles. The CITER 190 also carried Dekunu 1, a device developed by Dekuno Technologies targeting skydivers. Dekunu 1 has an enhanced altimeter that also has a 3D location tracker flight analyzer, and situational awareness tool that can gather flight data. Black Sky Aerospace is currently working on a range of suborbital rockets and is positioning itself as a suborbital payload delivery system provider. This first BSA hypersonics launch marks the beginning of Australia's commercial launch industry. Very exciting times for Australian space. And staying in Australia, and once again in Queensland, RUAG Space signs an agreement with Australian rocket company Gilmore Space. Another of Australia's leading rocket companies, Gilmore Space Technologies, has signed a long-term collaboration and supply agreement with the global launch industry supplier RUAG Space, headquartered in Bern, Switzerland. The agreement, the first of its kind in Australia, explores the use of RUAG Space's new range of FlexLine carbon composite products in Gilmore Space's proprietary hybrid rockets. As previously reported here on Space News, the Queensland-based Gilmore Space is targeting to launch small satellites weighing up to 100 kilograms into, into low Earth orbits from 2020 and up to 400 kilograms from 2021. Rogue Space has a long history of providing reliable launch technologies for rockets like the Ariane 5, Vega and Atlas, said Gilmore Space CEO and founder Adam Gilmore. With this collaboration, we look to leverage on their proven expertise while lowering our launcher development costs and time to market. Olga Wenschke, Senior Vice President of Ruark Space, said, It has been very exciting to see the progress that Gilmore Space and Australia have made in the space domain since a we first met at the International Astronautical Congress in Adelaide last year, and we look forward to collaborating with them in their goal to provide lower cost access to space from Australia. Okay, to the United States and USA space policy. One US senator is seeking assurances from his colleagues about funding for two major NASA astrophysics missions. In a letter to the chairman and ranking member of the Senate Appropriation Subcommittee that funds NASA, Senator Chris Van Hollen, Democrats Maryland, asked them to raise the cost cap for the James Webb Space Telescope as they finalise a fiscal year 2019 spending bill. The James Webb Space Telescope will break that cost cap because of delays that pushed back its launch to 2021, although the additional funding for the program won't be needed until 2020. Van Hollen also recommended that Congress 
fund the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope, or WFIRST, mission at that level in the Senate's bill, $352 million to keep it on track for a launch in 2025. A House version of the bill offers less than half that amount for WFIRST, while the Trump administration proposal was to cancel the mission entirely. Michael. Okay, let's look at the International Space Station. A Progress cargo spacecraft docked to the station early last week after its launch on a Soyuz rocket two days earlier. The Soyuz FG rocket carrying the Progress MS-10 spacecraft launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, placing the spacecraft into orbit nine minutes later. The launch was the fourth for a Soyuz rocket since the Soyuz MS-10 launch abort more than a month ago, but the first for the FG version of the rocket, the same one involved in that failure. Okay, Angelo. NASA General. NASA is leaning towards a three-stage approach in the design of future human lunar landers. In recent presentations, NASA officials said the three-stage concept with ascent and descent modules as well as a transfer stage or tug would allow each module to be small enough to be transported on a range of launch vehicles as well as enable international cooperation. NASA hopes to test the descent stage of that system on a standalone robotic mission in 2024. NASA is still in the early stages of studies of human class landers, which it plans to develop alongside mid-sized robotic landers for science while making use of small, commercially developed landers. Finally, we're talking landers to the moon. Fantastic. Moving on. NASA's commercial crew. NASA plans to review the safety cultures at commercial crew providers Boeing and SpaceX. The review, first reported early last week by the Washington Post, We'll look at issues ranging from how many hours employees work at the companies to drug use policies. NASA didn't explain why they undertook this review so late in the development of the company's commercial cruise systems, but sources said it was triggered by the actions of, you guessed it, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk, which included video of him smoking marijuana that agency officials deemed erratic. <laughs> Both companies, in separate statements, emphasise their commitment to safety, including policies on a drug-free workforce. Now, despite this review, later in the week, the latest commercial crew schedules were announced by NASA. You will recall that the commercial crew providers must demonstrate that their systems are ready to begin regular flights to the space station. Two of those demonstrations are uncrewed flight tests known as Orbital Flight Test for Boeing and Demo 1 for SpaceX. After the uncrewed flight test, both companies will carry out spacecraft abort tests to demonstrate their crew escape capability during an actual on-pad for Boeing or ascent for SpaceX emergency. The final test flights for each company will be crewed flight tests to the space station prior to being certified by NASA for operational crew rotation missions. The following target dates reflect the current schedule as announced last week. The test flight planning dates are as follows. For Boeing, Boeing orbital flight test, the uncrewed, is March 2019. The Boeing crew flight test is August 2019. In between those two, the Boeing pad abort test will occur. With SpaceX, SpaceX Demo 1, which is the uncrewed, will be January 7th, 2019, a firm date now, which is great. And the SpaceX Demo 2, which is the crewed flight, will be June 2019. And in between those two will be SpaceX in-flight abort. So we have some really good dates there. The anticipated readiness dates for operational missions are as follows. First operational mission will be August 2019. Presumably that's going to be SpaceX. And the second operational mission will be December 2019, presumably Boeing. So there you have it, folks. We're getting really close. As if to confirm the commercial crew schedules, the following day NASA invited media to the SpaceX demonstration mission one launch in January. NASA announced that media accreditation was now open for SpaceX's Demo-1 uncrewed flight test to the International Space Station as part of NASA's 
commercial crew program. The launch of SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket and Crew Dragon spacecraft is targeted for January 7, 2019, from the historic Launch Complex 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This will be the first uncrewed test flight of the commercial crew program and will provide data on the performance of the Falcon 9 rocket, Crew Dragon spacecraft, ground systems, as well as on-orbit docking and landing operations. The flight test also will provide valuable data towards NASA certifying SpaceX's crew transportation system for carrying astronauts to and from the space station. Michael. NASA Lunar and Planetary. NASA has selected a Martian crater that once hosted a lake and river delta as the landing site for its next rover mission. NASA announced last week that the Mars 2020 mission will land in Jezero Crater, which, early in the planet's history, had a lake of up to 250 metres deep, with a river delta flowing into it. The region likely has sedimentary layers ideal for preserving evidence of any past life there. Mars 2020, based on the Curiosity rover, will cache samples for later return to Earth, although the architecture for future missions to retrieve those samples is still under development. NASA has formally shut off the Kepler spacecraft. The agency said that it transmitted the final commands to the spacecraft, instructing it to shut down its transmitters and disable safety modes that could cause it to inadvertently turn back on. NASA had announced last month that Kepler had exhausted its fuel, ending its mission to search for exoplanets. The commands were sent, by coincidence, on the 388th anniversary of the death of the spacecraft's namesake, astronomer Johannes Kepler. OK, let's go to SpaceX. SpaceX has raised $250 million in a new loan. The company completed the loan sale last week after decreasing the size of the deal from $750 million, a figure reported here on Space News just a couple of weeks ago. The decreased size of the deal was blamed on concerns potential investors had regarding SpaceX's business as well as worsening conditions on the credit market. However, Bank of America, which arranged the loan, reportedly received enough orders to be able to fund the loan at the original larger amount, but SpaceX decided to go with the smaller amount in part to make it easier to revise the loan conditions in the future if the credit market improves. Meanwhile, SpaceX's CEO Elon Musk hinted about further changes to the design of his company's next generation rocket. Tweeting recently, Musk said SpaceX was abandoning any efforts to make the second stage of the existing Falcon 9 rocket reusable in favour of accelerating development of the big Falcon rocket or BFR. That vehicle, he said, now has a delightfully counterintuitive new design, but he offered no new details about it. Musk had unveiled an updated design for the BFR just two months ago during the Dear Moon Circumlunar announcement, tweaking elements of the upper stage or spaceship part of the vehicle. Continuing with SpaceX, SpaceX's BFR is no longer a big Falcon rocket. SpaceX's CEO Elon Musk revealed on Twitter last week that the company was renaming the upper stage of the vehicle to Starship, while the lower booster stage would now be known as Super Heavy. The new name fits into a naming scheme that includes Starlink for SpaceX's broadband internet constellation and even Starman for the space-suited mannequin flown on the first launch of the Falcon Heavy. Peter. And finally this week, Virgin Orbit performed the first captive carry flight of its Launcher 1 system last week. As we anticipated in the last episode of Space News, the company's Boeing 747 aircraft took off from an airport in Victorville, California, with Launcher 1 rocket attached to its left wing and flew for nearly 90 minutes. Virgin Orbit said this flight, the first flight of this plane to carry a rocket, was picture perfect. Virgin Orbit plans several captive carry flights to collect aerodynamics and structural data, culminating in a test where the rocket is released in flight, 
car does not ignite its engines. Virgin Orbit says it now expects the first orbital mission for Launcher 1 to take place in early 2019. Yeah, that's it for this week. Thank you, gentlemen, and it's back to you, Andrew.